Thank you, Cindy. And let me say today, all of you who are here, you get extra credit because it's time change. We had to shovel feet of snow, and God will richly bless you for your attendance today. I am not much of a traveler as it comes to, to those that do a lot of traveling. I have I've been in a number of places uh, so far in my life, but not much of a, a, a big traveler. That being said, I live in a home with six kids, my wife and my mother-in-law, so maybe I need to find some place to go. But anyway, um, I, I've done some flying over the years, not a, not a ton. And um, with respect to flying, I don't think I don't think a great deal of it. I, Generally speaking, I'd say I, I don't really enjoy flying. It's not because I'm afraid. I, I just find, for one thing, that it's boring. Even if you have a window seat, you can't see much of anything. And besides that, there's all the ordeal, especially now that you have to go through. And so you have to, you have to get there early. You have to get a colonoscopy and do a DNA test. And uh, you have to like, do a, like family lineage and all, kind, all this ordeal just to even get to the terminal before you can get on the plane. But then when you get on the plane... You've done all this waiting, and then you feel like you even have to wait more because you're having to listen to all this information that you find, that's not, why are they even talking about this? For example, and likely you have experienced something similar to this if you have been on a plane. Uh, now they use, uh, you'll have a flight attendant up there demonstrating some of this as a video is playing on a screen. But they'll, they'll begin to talk about all of these things that you need to do in the event of an, of an emergency. And... One of the things that they will talk about is how your seat can also be used as a flotation device. Now, I have found that puzzling because, for example, I have flown from Charlotte to Pittsburgh. I have flown from Charlotte to Fort Worth, from Greensboro to Nashville. And they're still talking about a flotation device. I'm thinking... Is, is there something that you might have that could help with like a, like a cornfield or a, like a parking lot, the roof of a building? How about, could, could we sign up uh, maybe in this area for the parachute seats? How about, how about that? I need a flotation device. I, I need a parachute. And so I'm hearing all of this, and as I'm hearing this, I'm saying to myself, that doesn't have anything to do with me. That doesn't have anything to do with me. Oftentimes, we hear things or read stuff, and very quickly we say, that has nothing to do with me. Hold that thought for a second and consider and step back what we have been and continue to think about, which is this. That we see in Acts chapter 2, as the, the church has been birthed, that God is working in amazing and significant ways. And I believe what was true of them also provides the, the ripe environment for God, even in 2023, to work in significant ways. And what we've been thinking about is how the early church was and how we aspire also to make sure that we as a fellowship have four things that are true of us. That we are those that are biblically grounded. That in terms of our relationships, we are meaningfully related. That we are prayerfully focused and we are gospel-centered. And over the past uh, couple of weeks, we've been talking about this whole idea of being prayerfully focused. And if it is the case that we or anyone or a family is prayerfully focused, that's saying that it's, that it's important, that it is something that we actually focus on, that we are intentional about. And you are intentional about, and you focus on things that are important. And it's very easy for us to, to look at passages because there's stacks of them, where the Bible talks about prayer, and there's instruction, and there's examples, and there's all of these things. And we spent a couple of weeks thinking about that, but there is something that oftentimes is associated with prayer that so many times as we see it, you're like me on an airplane, where you say, that has nothing to do with me. But the Bible regularly links like horse and wagon to prayer, and that's the experience and the discipline of fasting. You're thinking, oh, <laughs> fasting. In fact, even hearing that word right now, you may be thinking, this has nothing to do with me. But the reality is, as a follower of Christ, it should have something to do with you. And it ought to be something for all of us, truth be told, that is a part of, at various points, our experience of following the Lord and being individually and as families and a church 
prayerfully focused. So with respect to the topic, though, what we want to think about is this very specific question. What do I need to understand about fasting? What do I need to know and get as it relates to this? Because the Bible does say some stuff to me about this. I believe, first of all, what we... In fact, let me encourage you to go ahead and turn to your Bibles. It's going to take us a moment to get there, but in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, uh, which comes to us where we're, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Last week we were looking at what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount about prayer, and very much the things that he says about prayer, he also says about fasting. And starting in verse 16 of Matthew 6, Jesus says this, Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites. For they make their faces unattractive so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What is it that I need, that you need, that we as a fellowship need to know about fasting? Well, first of all, what we need to know is this. The practice of fasting puts you in good company. The practice of fasting puts you in good company. And in terms of the, the normal structure that I may follow in terms of, of sharing a message, today is, is going to be a d- bit different, in part because there is not a specific passage in the Bible that tells us kind of the answer to this question, everything that we need to know. What we see is a very number of examples. In fact, the passage that we just read where Jesus is sharing in the Sermon on the Mount is one of the, the only passages where at some length, We're given instruction with respect to this discipline. But what I want you to understand, though, is that Jesus here in the first century and the right-hand side of the Bible is talking about fasting. But it is not simply a New Testament concept. It is a practice that... It's not a practice that just showed up around the time of Jesus. Think with me about some of the biblical examples of those where we have the record of their experience of this discipline. For example, we are told that Moses fasted for 40 days before he received the commandments from God that he then shared with the nation of Israel. Elijah, after he hears about the threat from from Jezebel, he goes and is uh, fasting for, again, 40 days. David, when he has had this adulterous affair with Bathsheba and sought to cover up that affair by having her husband murdered, the child that is born from this becomes stricken by God and is fatally ill. And David fasts before God praying for this son. In the days of Esther, we read how she fasted and the people along with her for three days before she goes and has a conversation with the king. Uh, While it is the case, and we read this repeatedly, that God gave Daniel uh, this amazing gift at interpreting dreams and visions, what you see by the time you get to the 12th chapter of Daniel is that there is this vision that that he has received that he doesn't get. And Daniel fasts for a period of three weeks until it becomes one that he is able to clearly understand. When Nehemiah heard about the condition of Jerusalem... Not simply that it had been sacked and so much of it had been destroyed, but even after people had gone back, that it still was a city in ruins. And even the gates around the city were in disrepair. We're told that Nehemiah fasted in response. In the New Testament, we see what we come to know as the Apostle Paul when he's still Saul. You remember, he is this persecutor of Christians, and he has this amazing encounter with God on the road to Damascus, headed to go and round up more followers of Jesus. You remember there is this great blinding light and this voice that he hears, and he knows it's God, and he's saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And his eyes become scale-covered, and at this moment he falls on his knees, and this is the beginning of Saul's process of following Jesus and as he gets to Damascus to kick off what is going to become the the start of the greatest missionary in the history of the Christian church what is he doing he's fasting and of course Jesus serves as our greatest example not simply in the New Testament but our greatest example period and before his public ministry begins where does Jesus head he heads into the wilderness and what's he doing for 40 days and nights he is fasting. I say and share all of that to paint a picture. And the picture is this. 
First of all, outside of Jesus, none of the people that I listed is perfect. Every one of them has the things that they have done wrong, and many of them have the things that are done wrong that are still etched in the pages of Scripture where to this day we still know about it. But what we do know is that every single one of those is somebody that was ultimately, in spite of their failure, serious about their relationship with God. They were serious about following God, and also every single one of these is an individual that God used in significant ways. And what do we find is true of every single one of those? That fasting was a part of their discipline as a follower of his. Why does that matter? I'm not a fan of restaurants getting cutesy with names on bathroom doors. By that I mean this. Perhaps it is the case that you have been to a seafood restaurant of some sort, especially like a more southern style like fish camp type place and you go to the bathrooms and you see on the door one says buoys b-u-o-y-s and the other says gulls you like that don't you i I didn't come I, i don't like that be very clear be very specific i don't like um have you been to to the outback before and there's says sheila's and blokes I'm not going to lie. I had to think about it. <laughs> I don't like that. I, I want this to be very clear. But I, and I, I can't remember. I think it was at a Chili's. And I hadn't been to a Chili's in probably 10 years or more. I think they used to have something, some cutesy little name on their bathroom doors. <laughs> anyway, I, I go into this restroom. And my first thought was, it looks a little different here. Changed it around. There's some, some stuff I expected to see that I didn't see. Maybe this is a, uh, a recent innovation. And then the door opens and this woman walks in. And I'm like, oh, oh. That let me know I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> that was before it was cool. Now, <laughs> it's, anyway. But the fact that that woman was in this restroom with me indicated, hey, Michael, you're not in the right place. You are not in the right place. I say all of that, and it's, it's, it's hyperbole, though, to help drive home the point of this. Regularly in life, what we can do, in fact, I think this is a demonstration of prudence and wisdom. And I'm not suggesting that it is the singular authoritative determining factor but one of the things i believe regularly as followers of god that we need to do is in in basing where we are and whether we are where we should be is to look around and see who's who's with me who else either is or has been doing this type of thing well if you find yourself well well, i'm doing this and well that's what david koresh did it's probably a pretty good example you ought not be doing that Because you're in bad company. But here we've got Moses, David, Nehemiah, Esther, Jesus, Paul. That's a pretty good crew, isn't it? And every single one of them is practicing this discipline. And so something that I need to get, that we all need to get, is that when I do this, whenever I do this, that puts me in some really good company. That should encourage me. There's something else I need to know, and that's this. The what of fasting may change, but the how shouldn't. The what of fasting may change, but the how shouldn't. The words of Jesus here in this passage really drive that point home. He is very clear, though, but he's speaking in general terms with respect to fasting in general. And before we consider some of the general things that he says, I want you to think with me very specifically about the experience of fasting Which, first of all, is this. If and when an individual is fasting, what are they doing? What are they doing? Well, you are doing something, or rather not doing something, that would be part of your normal routine, part of your normal life. Now, most of the time when we hear the word fasting, we think it means that that we're not eating or drinking. And it could involve that, but it can involve a whole stack of other things. And before going further, let me just say this. It may be that you could give consideration to the experience of fasting as it relates to food. However, that is not something that everyone should consider. 
Do not do something that would intentionally put your health in jeopardy. For example, it would not be prudent for a diabetic to say, I'm not going to be eating for some lengthy period of time. Why? You could, you could wind up in the hospital or at the funeral home. Don't do that. And so I say that because fasting from food or drink is just a possibility because generally speaking, broadly speaking, when we're talking about fasting, we're talking about denying something that is part of my regular routine. Well, food and eating and drinking is part of my regular routine, but that's not it exclusively. There are other things. And there are other things from which we could fast. Uh, it could be, uh, for example, especially in this modern era, and it, it wouldn't have been dare thought of by somebody like Saul or somebody like David or any of the, the writers that we have in the pages of Scripture. Uh, but in truth, something that we could benefit from, if we're honest, is some fasting from technology because our lives are lived so connected. And whether it is uh, connected through constantly being available in its text messages or its social media or its YouTube or its TV or whatever, whatever it is. So many times there is never a quiet moment at all in our mind because it's filled with all of this. And it could be that God may impress you to fast as it relates for some period of time to technology. Maybe that doesn't mean that you turn your cell phone off, but it does mean that you turn the data off and the only thing that can happen is that you could make or receive a phone call, which I know that's shocking that that's ultimately what these things were intended to do. Fasting could be a fast from technology, but it could also be something that's even behavioral. In fact, even the New Testament speaks of, and Paul writes about how it is that in a marital relationship, couples should not uh, deny each other the experience of sexual intimacy unless it is for praying and fasting. So it could be that you say... Hey, this, this is, we're, we're taking a break from this because we're going to be choosing to, to be fasting for this period of time. Why is it that we should be doing this? All, all I'm saying, and, and get me in this, that with respect to fasting, we are giving up something, something that has some value to us, that is a regular part of our routine, and we deny ourselves this because we want to accomplish something. And Jesus starts by saying, when you do this, he says, don't be like the hypocrites. This is exactly how the passage last week dealing with, uh, with prayer starts. And we talked about how the word hypocrite there literally means pretenders or actors. And he's saying there are people that pretend with respect not just to prayer but also with fasting. And how they operate is this. They make their faces unattractive so that their fasting is obvious to people. In short, what they do is to try to... How are you? Okay. Is everything all right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fasting. Why, why would somebody do that? Well, th they were doing this because they are a pretender. They are an actor. And an actor wants to present an image to convey something that, is, that they want to present about themselves that is, purports to be true that is not. When someone is operating this way and, and, and fasting in whatever form that it takes, when, when they are doing this in ways that intentionally draw attention to themselves and to the fact that they are fasting from something, th they are seeking to convey an image of what? I am so spiritual. You'll never, you'll never be like me. That's what they're doing. Jesus says, don't do that. And instead, he says that you, that, that, that you want to operate very differently. And you want to operate very differently. In fact, you want to operate in such a way that that people don't know. That doesn't mean that people in your household can't know that you're fasting in, in some form or fashion. They may very well need to. But it should be that, that everybody else in the free world, that they don't know it, that you're not saying, oh, by the way, attention Facebook listeners, I will not be eating for the next three days because I am so godly and you are such pagans. You are not, you're, we're not to be doing that because our focus should not be on what others are thinking. Rather, 
He says it is to your father who is in secret. Why do we, or why did anyone ultimately, at least for the right reasons, ever fast? It has everything to do with this word, focus. It has everything to do with focus. I am adjusting in some form or fashion what is my normal routine because I want to focus on God. There is something that I am going through. There is some crossroads that I am at. There is some burden that I am vexed by. There is some need that I am dealing, and I need to to focus on Him. And so to help me accomplish that, I'm going to adjust my normal routine. I'm not going to be acting like things are just normal because they're not. There is something that needs to change. I need to do something. I need to take this next step, and I have no idea what it is. I have this burden that I cannot shake, and I don't know what to do about it. And I need to focus on Him. The ultimate aim of fasting, in whatever form that it takes, is is a matter of of focus. I don't know how much of it is age-related versus how much of it is the fact that we've got a a lot of kids and responsibilities or just because there's a lot of balloons up in the air of my mind. But I have, over time, become increasingly forgetful. I'll, I'll, I'll walk into a room and I'll say, huh, I wonder what I'm here for. A variety of reasons that could play into this. And because of that, there are plenty of things, even not just ordinary things, but even important things that I want to remember that sometimes slip my mind. And so I have this advanced way to deal with this. Now, there, there are some apps that I use on phone or tablet that, that help me in this. But you know what a surefire way for me to make sure that I don't forget something? It involves a Sharpie in my left hand. And so if, if, if I need to remember something... I will get a Sharpie, and I will write it on my hand. Why do I do that? Because that's outside the norm. I don't normally have something written on my hand. And because it is outside the norm, it captures my attention and makes sure that my focus gets on this. Listen, that's exactly what fasting does. It's exactly what fasting does. It serves as a reminder to get your focus where you know that it needs to be. And so let's say, for example, that fasting for you at some particular point may be that it's fasting from food for whatever time period. It could be a day. It could be a a segment of the day. It could be for a period of days, whatever it is. The reality is this. If you go for some period of time without eating, you're going to get hungry. And you're going to feel hungry. And your stomach's going to start talking to you. And when that happens, what does that do? It serves as a reminder. As you feel hunger and you think, man, I would really love something to eat, that reminds you, why am I doing this? Why am I hungry? I am hungry because I've stopped the normal routine because, again, it's a matter of focus. I'm going through something where I need to make sure that my focus is on him. That my focus is on what I ultimately desire God to do in my circumstance. And so what I'm saying is the the how, or excuse me, the what of fasting. It could be food, it could be technology, it could be a a, a thousand different things. Limitless things. And I I can't tell you what 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 it could or should be. So the what of it may differ from person to person or even from incident to incident. Just because you fasted from food one time, it may be technologically it's a fast later. I don't know. So the what may differ, the what may change, but the how shouldn't. And by that, the how is that my focus is not on other people. It's not on drawing attention so that other people can see me. The how is what I want to experience is not that you see me, but that I see him and he sees me. And this will help me establish that focus. There's, there's a final thought that I want you to get with respect to this that I believe God wants us to get, and that's this. Fasting has, pay attention to these words, fasting has potentially meaningful benefits. Fasting has potentially meaningful benefits. Now, perhaps in hearing that statement, you're like, wait a minute, potentially meaningful. I mean, that's almost like saying, oh, the education lottery, you have a potential benefit in winning a trillion dollars. I mean, Potential meaning? Well, what's the use? 
I say potential because, again, it has everything to do with motivation. And so if the motivation in fasting is for other people to see you and take notice, if the, the motivation behind fasting in whatever form or fashion it takes is, is to affect the perceptions of other people, then Jesus says this, if that's the case, at the end of verse 16, I tell you, those people, they have their reward. And so if you want people to notice, if you want people to think, ooh, they're fasting, you can experience that. That's your reward. But here's the question, is that meaningful? Nope. Because you know what? We're all forgetful. We remember for about that long. Okay, so-and-so was fasting. We forgot it before we went to bed. whoop de doo If your aim is to have other people think that you are something or to generate attention, to, to draw accolades to yourself, to draw the attention and focus of others, you can have that. But I'm going to tell you, there is no real meaning in that. But Jesus continues by saying, don't operate like that. I want you to operate where you're presenting yourself as though everything is normal. I want you to look maybe even better than normal or at least as good as normal. Wash your face. Put some lotion on. Make sure you, you don't have greasy hair. I mean, to present yourself like things are, are normal so that you're not generating questions, so that you're not attempting to, to prompt people to say, hey, are, are you doing this? Because your aim is what? Not to be obvious to others, but rather your Father who is in secret, so that other people don't know about it, but you do and God does. And notice how the end of verse 18 occurs. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. That's where the potential meaningful benefit occurs. Now, if the focus is not on others, but it's towards him, if the motivation is to alter the normal routine, the normal customs, and to... to affect my focus that I'm repeatedly throughout a day or days making time in form to talk to him about what the need is and to demonstrate to him and demonstrate to myself that I'm appealing to him because I know that what he wants for me is best and that his plans for me are, are best. What do you think is going to happen? I think God's going to respond. I mean, doesn't that go without saying? That if I am pursuing him, and I'm wanting to operate like him, and I'm wanting to experience what he wants for me in these circumstances, do you not think that he's going to respond to that? I'm telling you, he will. Jesus says that he rewards that. Well, what does the reward look like? I don't know. I, I, I can't tell you for sure what that reward is going to be. But I do have this confidence. I have confidence that if I am pursuing him, focusing on him, and talking to him about the need that I have with the aim of experiencing what he knows is best for me, he's going to bless that. And if the circumstances is I need guidance with respect to this particular situation, I think he will bless me and reward me by giving me that guidance and peace about the decision that I'm making. It just stands to reason. If my focus is on him... He's going to reward that. He is going to bless this. I realize today is March the 12th, which means that we are a month and three days away from tax time. And uh, I've heard so many say, well, I've got my taxes done or I've sent mine off and... I wish it was the case that I could say I've already checked that box, but I haven't. And hopefully within the next week or so, I'll gather all my stuff. I've had a CPA uh, for years that has taken care of it. I need to gather all that stuff and get them sent to him so I can get this stuff completed. How it works, though, he's in Charlotte. I've, I've used him since uh, 2001. And so I will send him all of my stuff. He will, uh, based on the questionnaire and everything that I've given to him, he will uh, do my state and federal returns. And he, he kind of has that ready as a draft. And then he calls me, and he says, okay, this is where we are. This is what you owe, or this is what you're getting back, or whatever. And invariably, I will ask this question. Is there anything else that I can do? Is there something else that's out there that I could take advantage of? Now, hear me in this. I want to pay everything that I need to pay. 
because we ultimately all benefit from the fact that we're paying taxes. It's nice to have police and sidewalks and roads and schools and all of these and an army. It's nice to have all these things and taxes pay for that. We need that. It's prudent for each of us to pay. It's prudent for me to pay taxes. But here's the thing. I don't want to pay one more cent than I have to. I want to pay everything I need to and everything I have to, but I don't want to pay one cent more. And so I will ask the count, hey, is, is, there, is there anything else, like any change of the tax code that, 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 that might affect me, that we need to think through, that might reduce my, my taxable income, that might, whatever, that might uh, positively benefit me? And there have been some instances where the answer was yes, but generally speaking, the answer is no. And I'll say something like this. I just don't want to leave anything on the table. I don't want to leave anything on the table. Listen again to the words of Jesus. That when we are operating with this discipline, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Can we just be honest and say, first of all, we don't talk about this like we should. We don't practice this like we should. And this is the preacher talking to the preacher and the preacher talking to the church. We, this is true probably for most all of us. Because of this, Jesus says that when we're practicing this, your Father who sees in secret will, will reward you. You know what that tells me? We've been leaving stuff on the table. There's benefit that God wanted to bring in my life. There's guidance I could have experienced. There's needs that could have been taken care of. There's doors that could have been opened. But I left it on the table. I want you to consider something. And, uh, and to see if you feel like God is in you doing this, even this week. I'm wanting all of us to ask ourselves and consider the experience in some form or fashion of fasting this week. For some it's food, for others it's technology, for, I, there's a variety of things. My encouragement, first of all, is to say, and I, I sent some emails, I talked to my Wednesday classes about this, that you might come this morning prepared with something on your mind, some need that you have, that you're at a crossroads of decision. There's some burden that you have been dragging like an albatross around your neck, and it has been weighing you down like an armored car sitting on your shoulders, and you need God to work in some particular form or fashion, uh, to, to come to this place with that on your mind, because it may very well be that the solution to responding to that and dealing with that is the experience of fasting to get your focus where it needs to be. So I want you to consider something. And you may not be able to say right now what it would be, and I don't want you to be haphazard in this, but prayerfully consider and even say, God, this hasn't been part of my relationship with you. This hasn't been part of my practice, but I believe that it could be and it should be. And I'm wanting, I'm wanting to try this because from you, I don't want to leave anything on the table. And I don't know what form it would take, so will you, will you guide my step in that? And I think God will impress you with something. I really do. And then the form that it may take, the length that it may take, I don't know. That's between you and God. But will you consider making this at some point, even in the coming days, even this week, part of your experience of following the Lord? I really sincerely believe if we are going to be a prayerfully focused church, if we are going to be a prayerfully focused people, this discipline is going to be part of our practice. The question is, are you willing to make it part of yours? Will you bow your heads with me?